what's up? Welcome to my channel. Last week I posted a little get ready with me video where I told the story about King Tut. And the response from you guys was pretty positive. It seemed like a lot of you found it very interesting. So I thought I'd keep it going. So the historical time period that caught my attention this week was the French Revolution. The French Revolution, you guys, was absolutely bonkers. And while Marie Antoinette's story is a big part of the French Revolution, they're not the same story. So if you wanna hear more about the French Revolution in the future, definitely give this video a thumbs up and let me know down in the comments. So without further ado, let's get into the story of Marie Antoinette. So little miss Marie Antoinette was born into Austrian royalty. As a child, her tutors would describe her as quite lazy, frivolous, and hard to teach. Even her own mother once said about her that she was quite pretty, but rather uninteresting. Marie Antoinette's mother had quite a few daughters, actually. Marie Antoinette was the youngest girl of 16 children. Her mother was the Empress of Austria, which is basically the Queen of Austria. So her mother really liked to use her daughters as these sort of political bargaining chips to forge stronger alliances with other countries. And little Marie Antoinette was no exception. At all of 15 years old, little Marie Antoinette was sent to France to marry the heir to the French throne, who was Louis XVI. They were both 15 years old. So Marie Antoinette was promptly sent to France and when she got there, she was stripped of all her Austrian possessions. And when I say stripped, I mean that she was literally stripped. They took everything from her, including her clothes. She wasn't allowed to keep so much as a brooch or a ring. They were basically like, congratulations, you're French now. Austria who? We don't know her. She was there for about a day or two before her and Louis XVI actually got married. What was so funny to me about this part of the story was that once they were married, there was a great deal of attention paid to their sex life, or rather their lack of a sex life. Why was there so much attention paid to their sex life, Haley? How is that even anyone's business? Well, it was actually everyone's business at that time. You see, as the now sort of French princess, if you will, Marie Antoinette's number one job was to produce an heir. And that's really the only job that she had. So the fact that it took them seven years to consummate their marriage was actually very well documented. The monarchy at that time, the king and queen at that time, held absolute power over France. All decisions, including financial decisions, were ultimately theirs. And what you should understand about the royal family's living situation is that the royal family lived in Versailles. Versailles was a town that was kind of outside of Paris and they lived in this huge mansion, palace, estate, whatever you wanna call it. But the point is they lived very shut off from the rest of the country. So they were really out of touch with the people of their country. And so when they became king and queen at 19 years old, it was basically like handing them a credit card without a limit. And this was the time when all of those crazy extravagant looks associated with Marie Antoinette, as far as like the crazy hairdos and the big crazy gowns and things like that, that's when all of this kind of started to transpire. Once they became king and queen is when things really started to go south economically for France. I mean, things were already pretty bad for them at that point. France had been engaged in a lot of wars and were just losing money like crazy. And what was so interesting to me was that her mother over in Austria was keeping really close tabs on her while she was over there. She had like secret spies that would report all of her activity back to her mother. So her mother would write her letters telling her like, girl, you need to chill. You know, she would tell her that queens should be modest in their fashions and that 
she needed to pay more attention to the affairs of her country and her people, like basically telling her to like straighten up and like go be a queen, you know? But no, Marie Antoinette kind of just ignored her mother and advisors. And Louis was kind of always described as being this sort of awkward, gawky, chubby kid that was not designed for political power is kind of how he was always described. Her and her husband were always described as being like complete opposites. Basically, he was a day bird, she was a night owl. He really enjoyed hunting, fishing. Then Marie Antoinette would be up all night. She loved to party, she loved to gamble. Finally, by the time they turned 21, they had consummated their marriage and had their first child. The country of France was very excited and they celebrated it. Although this kind of joyfulness throughout the country would not last long. So as we get deeper into their tenure as king and queen of France, the nation of France just continued to plunge further and further into debt. In France back then, there was a very rigid social hierarchy that were broken into three estates. Basically, all the people that had all of the power and money were in the first and second estate. The third estate was made up of like the middle to lower class, really just the lower class at this time because France was in a lot of debt. So things just continually got worse and worse and worse in France, but the king and queen were pretty oblivious to it. They just sort of lived in their little palace in Versailles and did not have much concern for what was actually going on with the people of France. Eventually things got like really bad in France. Like really, really bad. Bad to the point where citizens started to riot. When I say rioting, I mean they were burning down buildings, killing people, putting their heads on spikes and parading them around town. And all of this started happening primarily because the cost of bread just got too high and the third estate, which made up about 90% of the population, just became too poor. So of course, this was just the wake up call that King Louis and Queen Marie Antoinette needed. What followed was a series of diligent and decisive actions from the monarchy that ultimately led to a period of prosperity and peace throughout the nation of France. Just kidding. No, when, when, when all of this went down, they didn't, they didn't really do much at all, it seemed like. And somewhat to her credit, around this time, they did lose a young son to tuberculosis. And there was, Marie Antoinette was even quoted as like at one point saying like, the people of France hardly noticed. And you know, they like rejoiced and celebrated that first child. So I guess she had gotten this sense that the citizens cared about her family, you know? So she was like, um, hello, my son just died. And the people of France were like, um, hello, my stomach and bank account are empty. And it was during these bread riots that Marie Antoinette was thought to have said that infamous line we associate with her, the let them eat cake. It's pretty widely accepted now that she never actually said that. I think it was sort of just the callous sentiment behind that statement that they were associating with her. Ultimately what happened was the third estate, which again was like the lower middle class, kind of rose up and created their own governing body that they decided was going to take over political power of France. And once the third estate, this new governing body was formed, they decided that it was time for the king and queen to return to Paris and live amongst the people and see what was actually going on. An angry mob of thousands of women got together and decided that they were going to march down to Versailles and get them. So this mob of women started to march and as they made their way out of Paris, the, the mob just continued to grow and grow and grow. So once this giant angry mob of people made it down to Versailles, they promptly raided the palace. They killed guards that worked at the palace, servants. They just were, were grabbing people, 
butchering them, and then putting their heads up on spikes. Once again, you see a trend, something that they enjoy doing. Eventually, this mob of people that raided the palace were able to capture the king and queen and forced them to return to Paris. Once they were back in Paris, this new National Assembly, which was the, the new governing body that the Third Estate had created, they were making demand after demand of the king and queen. Basically, they were at this point allowing them to remain as like the monarchy just took like all of their power. And so the king and queen, while they were trapped in Paris, they pretended like they were totally on board with the new way of doing things while actually quietly reaching out to other foreign monarchies for help. So remember how she had like a whole gaggle of siblings? Her brother at that time was actually the new guy in charge because her mother had passed by this point. They came up with this plan to escape France and try to reclaim their power from another country, from Austria particularly. So when it finally came time to make their grand escape, they were advised to take two small inconspicuous carriages out of Paris in the night. So that's what they did. They listened to their advisors and they took two small inconspicuous carriages and safely made it across the border in France and everyone lived happily ever after. Just kidding. Two small inconspicuous carriages for the queen? No. Marie Antoinette insisted that they take a royal carriage that was outfitted with a silver dinner service and a wine rack. And so, as you can probably already imagine, this attempted escape did not quite go as planned. Right as they were approaching the border, a bunch of citizens recognized them and they got mad. They got big mad, y'all. And a big, angry mob of citizens escorted them, you could say, back to Paris. And this attempted escape really upset people because up until this point, the royal family had kind of been acting like they were good with all of the new reform and everything like that. So once they were returned, they were taken to a prison in the middle of the city. I say prison because it was just like a big, creepy looking, different mansion, basically. So the governing, the new governing body was debating on what to do about the king. Ultimately, they put him on trial. He was convicted of treason. And by one vote, this new governing body voted to execute the king. After nearly a year of being posted up in this prison, Marie Antoinette got to see her day in court. Ultimately, she was convicted of treason. And that same day as her trial, she had all of her hair cut off, was taken in a small grungy wagon, paraded through town for all of the citizens to see her, up to the guillotine, and she had her head chopped off. The executioner, concluded the event by raising her head up in front of the entire crowd and letting them cheer. She was then buried in an unmarked grave. So that's the story of Marie Antoinette. It's such an interesting story to me because it seems like she had multiple opportunities to make a change, to do something that would bring about a positive impact for her family and for the country. And they never really did. You know, they kind of just lived very unapologetically in luxury while the citizens of their country were impoverished and starving. So, uh, you know, I think the takeaway is, is if you're put in charge of something, even if you don't like it, you can need to go ahead and be in charge of that and do your best to make it work. So anyways, let me know what you guys think about Miss Marie Antoinette. Who or what historical figure, time period, whatever, would be interesting to do an inspired look by next? Definitely let me know. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye!